Kevin Owens continues his stunner barrage. Randy Orton comes out of his shell, and will HBK come out of retirement to face Dolph Ziggler? Your full SmackDown Live review starts right after this. So, you guys know that we live in a world that's full of social media, technology, information sharing. What about your privacy and security? Have you guys thought about that? I take it very seriously, and that's why I purchased the Simple Proactive Privacy and Security book. It's by a military veteran, Alex Summers, who got fed up and worked to reduce the digital tracking of his family. It's the book that Silicon Valley doesn't want you reading. I mean, think about it, guys. We all make phone calls, okay? We do channel surfing. We do web browsing. We're, we all know we're all over social media. Everything we do gets tracked. This book can help you avoid the bait of phishing attacks, remove yourself from 27 people located websites that share our names, addresses, and other private information. There's a password manager and password generator. Protect your calls, your texts, everything. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're using iPhone, Android, if you have a PC or a Mac. Right now, this is the book that you guys need to check out. It's only $9.99 for paperback or $4.99 for Kindle. I'm going to be putting up a link on my Twitter, which is at WWE at the WWE podcast. So check it out. I would really recommend if you guys want to take this privacy thing seriously in a day and age where everything is shared, definitely check this out. Again, I'll be putting a link on my Twitter feed or just go on to Amazon and search the simple proactive privacy and security. Again, that's simple, proactive privacy and security, and get you and your family secured today. Welcome to the WWE Podcast, your place for the most passionate wrestling analysis on the web. Just turn Roman heel. What is WWE waiting for? When other wrestling podcasts put you to sleep, you can count on the WWE Podcast to keep you engaged and asking for more. I've been watching wrestling for over 20 years, and that was one of the best matches I've ever seen. This is unlike any other wrestling analysis. So without any further delay, let's get the show started right now. Welcome to the SmackDown Live review on the WWE Podcast. I'm your host, and thank you so much for joining me. A lot of, lot of good stuff to get to today. I have a lot of praise to give WWE on this edition of SmackDown Live that aired yesterday on July 23rd. So today's July 24th, 2019. Always like to announce the date so that if anybody's ever listening, you know when this was recorded. Uh, so thank you so much for listening. And those of you that are returning listeners, thank you so much. And all the feedback you guys have been giving me. Good, bad, and indifferent is all geared to make this show better for you. So thank you so much for all of that, and uh, welcome new listeners. You guys can find me everywhere that you can think of. So without listing it, you guys know any podcast app. Go to WWEpodcast.com if you guys want a full list of, the, of all these shows and articles. I've got some really good articles up that are not of my own doing, but of my team of contributors and authors that are covering a wide range of topics, not just the WWE main roster, but also NXT, WWE uh, NXT uh, UK, and also covering Lars Sullivan, um, a little bit of Shane McMahon, um, just really good stuff. Kevin Owens and Stone Cold's comparison, this, the Kevin Owens Stone Cold comparison, a lot of good stuff there. Uh, so check it out. Really, really worth the read. And, um, I think you'll be glad you did. So let's, let's start off with SmackDown Live, man. I mean, I, I enjoyed the show overall. I thought it was a, a very structured show. And the first thing that I want to talk about that is at the forefront of my mind is not Kofi Randy. It's not Kevin Owens. It is Dolph Ziggler and Shawn Michaels. Uh, And the question that I posed at the very, very top of the show was, will Shawn Michaels come out of retirement to face Dolph Ziggler? My short answer to that is no, but I wouldn't label it as impossible at the same time. I don't think it's completely out of the realm of possibility that Shawn Michaels comes out of retirement to face Dolph Ziggler. I think it's unlikely. I think he's more of the enforcer or um, uh, legend that just gets his payback on Ziggler for the super kick and gives Ziggler a super kick of his own at SummerSlam. I think that's much more likely than Shawn Michaels coming out of retirement. But I do believe that Shawn Michaels will be at SummerSlam in a physical capacity, 
not just there to observe, but to give Dolph Ziggler his receipt with some sweet chin music. And um, I think that's where WWE is going. And the, the main focus, the main uh, the main program is going to focus around The Miz and Dolph Ziggler. Now, does this end up in some kind of match with Ziggler and HBK? Again, I don't think so. But the comparison has been drawn for, what, a decade now? That Dolph Ziggler has a lot of Shawn Michaels qualities. He's the second coming of Shawn Michaels. We've heard that time and time again. And with through WWE's magical booking that they have provided Dolph Ziggler over the last decade, none of that has happened. Uh, while Dolph Ziggler is one of the best in-ring performers, one of the best sellers, that's sure as hell a lost art these days, and a solid talker on the mic, I wouldn't give him an A, but probably a C plus B minus on the mic, he can cut a good promo, he's athletic, he's unselfish in the ring, all the qualities of Shawn Michaels, extremely athletic, all of that. So that's where the parallel comes. Uh, they're also about the same size and stature. So there are some physical similarities as well. And uh, thank the Lord, by the way, that Shawn Michaels is growing his hair back out. I mean, I can at least take a crew cut. Anything but bald for Shawn. Please. I've made that point before. So I think uh, he's heeding the reaction. Or it's just his own personal decision. In which case, great. (laughs) Please, Shawn. No more bald. No more bald head. All right. Uh, So Shawn Michaels and Ziggler, as I said, I think this ends up in a sweet chin music with... uh, Dolph Ziggler left laying at SummerSlam. Um, But I expect a very good match between The Miz and Ziggler. If you remember, The Miz and Dolph Ziggler have a storied rivalry. The most recent being uh, a year or a year and a half ago-ish when Ziggler put his career on the line against The the Miz for the Intercontinental Championship. And it was a very emotional storyline and Ziggler ended up winning. And it was the opposite roles. The Miz was the baby face or the heel, and Ziggler was the baby face in that uh, in that current program. And now they flip flopped. To me, a more appropriate role for Ziggler. Ziggler is a guy that again that's extremely hard to get behind for the simple fact that we have no reason to believe that Dolph Ziggler is ever going to get uh, pushed by the WWE machine. So uh, we have no reason to ever believe in him. Therefore, just boo him because he's not a guy that is any that anybody can really live vicariously through or get behind in any kind of real way. So fine. I think that's a much better role. The Miz has played a heel for the majority of his career. I'm ready to see Babyface Miz. And we've gotten Babyface Miz since before WrestleMania when Shane turned on The Miz. And uh, so since that time, Miz has been... Has been Babyface for a good, what, four or five months now? And I think so far so good with The Miz. I mean, he's gaining more momentum by the week. At first, he felt a little bit like Kevin Owens in that, hey, uh, yeah, he's playing a babyface, but when's the other shoe going to drop? When is that next turn going to happen? I don't trust him. And he's starting to gain the affection of fans because he has been here for a long time from the time he was hosting SmackDown as Mike Mizanin, The Miz from Real World, um, Hoorah, and all that nonsensical garbage. He has really, I think, come into his own and finally earned the respect of fans. The fans have had many years to boo him, and it's a good time to turn him, and I would not turn him back at any any time in the near future. And I'm talking the next year plus. So uh, good roles for both. Again, I think this program will focus around Dolph Ziggler and The Miz. And while Shawn Michaels will give his receipt to uh, Dolph Ziggler and uh, hit Sweet Chin Music, I think we will have to wait till SummerSlam for that to happen. Um, but it's good to see Shawn Michaels in a bit of a physical capacity rather than just standing there or sitting there doing his typical deprecating, self-deprecating humor of pretending that he's winded walking to the ring or talking about how old he is or whatever kind of weird stuff that they pull themselves down with that's self-deprecating but also damaging at the same time. It's nice when Sean tries to actually be Sean, not Sean placating to the fans that think he's old. And while if I acknowledge I'm old, it'll be funny and I'll take the power away. No, 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 no. Just be Sean Michaels and we'll be happy and grow your hair out. Thanks. Um, all right. 
Another item that I want to talk about, I'm going to talk about the big three here. Kofi Kingston and Randy Orton. I think we're all glad that Randy Orton and uh, Kofi Kingston pulled out that piece of footage from Madison Square Garden 10 years ago. Because that is really the match and point in which we all believed that Kofi Kingston was going to go to that next level, as Kofi said. And it didn't didn't happen. It didn't happen. Now, did Randy Orton have any influence behind the scenes in real life to pull Kofi down? I I don't believe so. I, I, I just don't. I think it was WWE at the time believing that they had a top guy. They didn't need anybody else. <clears throat> um, and John Cena was on top at the time. And some of you may not like this, but I think it's the damn truth. And I'm not advocating for it, nor do I support it or believe in it. But I think it is the truth that, hey, look, 10 years ago, WWE was still PG or they had just begun the PG era. And they they were all public and trying to placate to younger audiences and sponsors that would open up if they brought down the rating of their programming. But they, I believe, and and, and this is awful to say, but I, I believe that a part of, not all, a part of the reason that Kofi Kingston was not pushed the way that many expected him to be at that time, I think had to do with the fact that, hey, he's a black man. And, and I don't, I don't agree with that at all. I, I don't condone it. I think it's awful if that's the case. But WWE has had a history. This is where I back up my argument. And not just thinking, oh, you know, WWE's racist. Or Vince McMahon's racist. Uh, you know, the card that's played every single day in politics of he's racist, they're a bigot, you know, whatever. Uh, WWE has shown over the last 20 years, that they do not treat on-air African-American talents with as much respect as they do with the white talent of WWE. And are they changing that? Of course. I'm talking about over the long history of WWE. I'm not talking about the last five years or so, uh, recent history. <clears throat> so, I mean, think about what they've done. Crime time. Really? So they have two guys from Brooklyn who call themselves crime time and play the stereotypical African-American, quote, ghetto character. They have our truth being the butt of a joke for the last 10 years. Talking about sacks of potatoes. I remember that when he had little Jimmy and all that stuff. Um, They just do not have a good history with with black uh, black stars. So do I think back then that it had a little bit to do with the color of Kofi's skin? Maybe, maybe I, I would not, I wouldn't you know, bet my house and my life on it, but sadly I wouldn't bet against it either. So I think that was a part of it. Um, and it's, if, if that's true, that's, that's sad, but moving on to current day with this program, as we move away from politics and race is that Randy Orton is a guy that, uh, and I've mentioned this so many times too. He's a guy that could be five times more talented. Well, excuse me. He could be five times better in terms of in-ring performances if he actually put the effort in and cared to put the effort in. And I don't think anybody would disagree with me that, yeah, Randy Orton's been there for 18 years. But at the same time, how many five-star classics has he given us? I, I mean... I can't think of too many that Randy Orton's given us that just blew you away. And you said, oh my God, what a match. That's a match I'll remember forever. Some off the top of my head that I can remember from Randy Orton, at least during his uh, earlier years, were Mick Foley versus Randy Orton in that hardcore match that they had when he went for the RKO and Mick Foley pushed him on some tacks. Uh, I remember that spot. I remember him winning the... World Heavyweight Championship as the youngest superstar in history doing it, and then spitting in the face, the biggest loogie you've ever seen in Triple H's face to turn uh, baby face. A lot of faces in that sentence. Um, you know, I remember him against Undertaker at WrestleMania when he RKO'd Taker, and we all believe the streak might be over after he reversed the choke slam, I believe. So there are moments that Randy Orton has in my brain that have stuck, and I'm sure there's a, there's a lot more. I mean, he's, my God, he's the, the RKO spot was Seth Rollins at WrestleMania. Uh, it might have been WrestleMania 30. 
that was crazy when he reversed the curb stomp at the time to an, into an RKO. Um, so there's lots of spots, right? He's oh, okay, and he's RKO'd Stephanie McMahon. He's RKO'd, uh, you know, you name it. I, I think he's even RK. Didn't he RKO Wayne Brady? I think he did that too. Um, so there's moments and spots that Randy Orton's career of Randy Orton's career that I remember, but there's not a large body of work or a large number of matches that I go, oh my god, remember that, remember this, remember this. It's just Randy Orton being v- good to very good, but very rarely touching great in a match. Randy Orton very rarely goes into that 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 uh, that realm, that level of great, very rarely. And it's, it, it, but the thing is, what kills you is he could, at any given moment, could do it. That's the kicker. That's the kicker is that Randy Orton could be that at any time that he wants to be. But Randy Orton has made it a priority to just extend his career as long as possible, get paid as much money as he can, and he's already been there for 18 years. He doesn't have anything left to prove to anybody. He's just, I feel like Randy Orton is just kind of coasting. He just is kind of coasting, puts on good matches without even trying, and very rarely turns it up to that next level. So that's kind of Randy Orton's career in a nutshell. Very successful, but not as successful as you could have imagined him being. And you know what? If that's what Randy Orton wants to do with his life and his career, who am I to say otherwise? Right? Who are we to say otherwise that, Randy, come on, do a little bit more here. We should appreciate the fact that Randy Orton barely even tries. And he is as good and as smooth in the ring as he is. It's, it's amazing to think that. He makes it look like anybody could get in there and do what he does. He's that good. But when you're that good and you don't apply it and try to make yourself better and put 100% effort into every match, that's what frustrates fans. And that's why Randy Orton's been kind of that legacy star, that guy that he's just that mainstay. He's the constant. He is good with, he can work with anybody. Uh, you know, he, he's just kind of there collecting a paycheck, putting on. B to B minus matches. That's just Randy Orton. That's just Randy Orton. Um, so that is that's kind of my recap on Randy. And, and, and you know, I think that him and Kofi will have a very good match. It could even touch four out of five stars. Again, if Randy Orton's motivated, and that's always a key question. Um, I know that these two are friends in real life, so maybe he will actually kick it into that next gear rather than just kind of going through the motions and just talking about the RKO being the three deadliest letters in sports entertainment, whatever. Uh, I I would like to see a motivated Randy Orton, a hungry Randy Orton. I want to see the potential of what he could do and be because Kofi's there. Kofi Kingston is there. He's already hungry. Kofi Kingston wants to stay on top as long as he can. He he knows that he may not get another shot at the WWE Championship. And if he does, I don't think he believes the reign would last as long as it has now. Winning at WrestleMania. He knows he's on a, on a wave that's eventually going to crash. It's inevitable. So, is Randy Orton going to give it everything he has and show what he could be? And help Kofi out in the process? Or is he just going to kind of be Randy Orton, the the B to B minus player? At any time could be an A to A plus, but I choose to be a B, B minus. It's like the guy that goes to class once or twice a week and somehow gets a B to B, you know, a, a, a B or B plus on an exam that they don't deserve to have because they're just that good. It's frustrating. It's frustrating, um, but I digress. So I'm looking forward to the match at SummerSlam. Again, I really think I am, and I don't think that Randy Orton's going to be the one to take it away from him. Early spoiler. It seems to be a very predictable outcome, um, but but again, Vince McMahon likes to make things unpredictable, especially at big pay-per-views, and while many people think that Kofi's going to overcome once again, could they put the strap on Randy? I think that they could. I mean, this could be a wolf in sheep's clothing type pick where we all believe it's a slam dunk and we get swerved. There's no money in the bank lingering out there anymore. Brock Lesnar's not out there anymore. This could be a Randy Orton win. 
It'll be interesting to see what happens here. SummerSlam is always a big turning point, and big things need to happen at SummerSlam because many times the SummerSlam events are seeds that are being planted for the WrestleMania build. So just keep an eye out for that. I would not put this, I wouldn't put any pick at SummerSlam on lock. I would not Uso this pick. So, all right, let's move down the line here to the next big ticket item. The, the Kevin Owens stunner barrage that he has been just decimating Sh- uh, Shane McMahon on a weekly basis here. Uh, and I'm, I'm liking it. I, I was a little bit disappointed. To, you know, I mentioned this last night that we didn't see a Kevin Owens stone cold Steve Austin interaction on the reunion show. But, the, you know, they didn't kill his career. It just could have helped it. So we get another uh, a stunner on Shane after Shane McMahon made the. Roman Reigns and Kevin Owens matchup that uh, ended up backfiring because he brought Drew in as the referee and Elias as the timekeeper or uh, and, you know, him himself. He was the ring announcer. But at the same time, here's a question. Why even bother having a timekeeper in WWE anymore? There's no time limits on matches. So what are they there for? Everybody just seems to always end at a perfect amount of time to make sure that they go off the air at the exact time every week. So if you're going to create the illusion that this is an actual competition, bring back time limits. That makes it sound legitimate. It's small. It's simple. You barely have to enforce it, but here's what it does. It gives you another finish. If you're the booking committee, the beloved booking committee of WWE, it gives you a finish. What if the time limit on a match is 15 minutes? The following matchup is for one fall with a 15-minute time limit. Good. So, you know, that it creates another possibility for a finish instead of DQ. Or WWE's obsession with the roll-up finish lately, with Charlotte being the latest victim, Samoa Joe on a weekly basis getting rolled up and you know, shocked that he lost every week. I mean, it's just uh, the roll-ups are a whole other thing that I'll get into in in a couple of minutes. Uh, But it gives you another out. Why would you not want flexibility in your finishes? So bring back the time limits. Just slip them back in. You don't even have to announce that that, that they're back. Just pretend they never left. And just have the ring announcer, when they're introducing the opponents, give the terms of the match. Simple. Simple. You know what it could do? Create a, It would end in a tie. You know what ties do? Extend programs. It makes you want to see a decisive, definitive winner. Instead of just the DQ finish. Right? So just something to, little, something to think about, WWE. Something to chew on. I don't know why you don't have time limits. In, in an environment you're supposed to be simulating sports, do you know of any sport that doesn't keep time for anything? Even baseball keeps time. They don't have limits on time. They have limits on times between pitches now, but every sport keeps time, and WWE doesn't really keep time. So the the timekeeper position is an obsolete position in the current structure of WWE storytelling. Okay, well, anyway, they had the whole team there, Shane McMahon's team uh, stacked the deck. It reminded me of, uh, what was it? Was it Backlash or Unfro? I'm not, not over the edge. One of the pay-per-views when Stone Cold first won his WWF championship against The Rock at WrestleMania 15. And he ended up facing Dude Love in uh, the following two pay-per-views. And in the the latter pay-per-view, Vince stacked the deck by having him be the special referee. Gerald Briscoe being the special timekeeper. And uh, some uh, Pat Patterson being the ring announcer. Um I mean, he stacked the deck completely, and Stone Cold ended up overcoming, and that's one of my favorite matches as well. And Dude Love was, I think, an underrated character as well. Uh, but it reminded me of that. I mean, it's something we've seen before, that he has all the control. There's no wiggle room, and somehow the baby face overcomes. But in this case, neither man can really afford to lose to the other. So I didn't expect, with both positioned to be baby faces, that this would be an actual match. I, I kind of had that feeling and inkling that it would be these two teaming up to just take down Shane's gang or uh, whatever you, you call it, the Mean Street Posse of 2019. I expected that. Um, and furthermore, 
I would have been very careful if WWE is still positioning Roman Reigns as a babyface to put him against Kevin Owens right now. That would be a huge mistake. And they recognized that and uh, had very little interaction, very little in the way of an actual match between those two, and just moved to the actual meat of the situation. And uh, Shane ends up getting stunned twice. Uh, Drew McIntyre is, is losing momentum very quickly. Drew McIntyre is sinking. And the holes need to be plugged quickly on Drew McIntyre. It's not irreversible or irreparable, but right now, Drew McIntyre is is falling and falling quickly into the abyss. And Elias seems to be that third wheel in the pack that uh, just is there, uh, occasionally plays some music, but is the guy that just takes the hits and the bumps. And uh, he's, I don't know, he, he's not exactly gaining any... Uh, any momentum being aligned with Shane at this point, he's he's kind of that third forgotten wheel. But I'm more concerned about Drew McIntyre, to be honest with you, a guy that we all picked to be that next WWE champion. I mean, a couple of months ago, we all said, hey, yeah, he could be the next guy. And every time you turn around, he loses the big match and loses the big match and then loses the big match. So, uh, I, you know, until they show me otherwise... I, I really have any hesitation. I, I do have hesitation to believe that Drew McIntyre is going to get that monster push, uh, similar to Samoa Joe, and we'll talk about that too. But um, I want to move on to Charlotte Flair, uh, and she ended up facing Ember Moon on SmackDown Live, and Ember Moon ended up getting the victory, the surprise upset. Now, how did she get this victory, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Because she got a victory in a way that it's never been done before. Ever. Ever. WWE came up with some creative that I don't know how they did it. It's extremely original, new. What they did was, and stay with me here. They had Bailey's music play. And Bailey started walking to the ring. And we had Charlotte turn around, see Bailey, and get distracted. Crazy, right? And then Ember Moon get, got the roll up victory for the win. It's great. I mean, whoever came up with this is genius. It's never been done before, and I, I just I don't know if they'll be able to pull it off again. The way it was just how great it was. Of, of course, guys, can you feel the sarcasm bleeding out of your ears right now, out of my voice, into your ears? This is a finish I wish they would just do away with completely. Whether you're a heel, a baby face, this finish makes everybody look foolish. I understand the heel is supposed to look like a fool. But this finish happens for baby faces. It makes heels look foolish to the point of not in a way I want them to look foolish. It makes them look stupid. Because they're supposed to be professional athletes. Why are you not focusing on what's in the ring? If the person outside of the ring comes in and interferes, guess what? It's a disqualification and you win. So Ember Moon gets the victory VO roll up and then slides out of the ring. And again, this finish is just super overdone. Uh, I'll just end it there. It needs, WWE needs to get a little bit more creative with this. Uh, if they want Ember Moon, Ember Moon to win, why couldn't Ember Moon just, uh, maybe get a little bit of the tights and, or maybe hit her finish early in the match for a really quick pin where Charlotte is shocked and, and she doesn't even know what hit her before the match is over. And you could chalk that up to Charlotte didn't expect that. And it was a fluke victory. Why does it always have to be a distraction from somebody's entrance music playing? I mean, think about this. You're in an NFL. You're on an NFL football team. You hear your opponent's music play, whatever their theme song is, in the middle of a play. Are you going to stop? Nope. You stop when a whistle or a flag is thrown. Whistle is blown or a flag is thrown. You don't stop because you hear music and then turn around and go, oh, my God, who's coming? No, 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 no. So, all right. But rumor has it 
that for SummerSlam, Charlotte is going to be facing none other than, none other than Trish Stratus. So I, I'm, I guess I'm looking forward to this. Trish Stratus didn't show me a whole lot when she tagged with Lita. Uh, I believe it was at what Evolution. I, I really, really didn't like the promos that they cut. They were super weak. Uh, I, I, Trish and Lita have never been known to be great on the mic. And boy, did it show the last time they were in WWE. They may be legends, and they are. They're trailblazers. They are innovators. They added credibility to a women's division that, if it weren't for them, were just sexified performers. They added the legitimacy that a women's division needed at that time. They are certainly legends in their own right. But boy, oh boy, did they get just scorched by the talent of today in promos. And their their comebacks and quick wit just does not exist. I mean, it just doesn't. Uh, so I hope that Trish Stratus is, if she does want her promos written for her, and I would actually suggest that on her end, that she uh, just go over them meticulously and try to recite them as if she's not trying to read them. Um, because... I just don't want to see Trish look like that again. It, it was it was hard to watch. It was hard to watch. Um, however, I'm still looking forward to the match. It's a good generational match. You could bill it as such. Uh, it is all but official as WWE hasn't announced it. It is through all the credible sites. Um, a, a all but done deal with Trish Stratus. She's been reported to be training for in ring return, uh, and. You heard the the little promo that little tidbit that Charlotte had in her promo that she's the greatest of all time of any generation. There's your key. So it's generation versus generation. Uh, you could bill it as that, and uh, we'll see what happens. I, you know, do I think Charlotte's going to win? Yeah. <laughs> this SummerSlam card is shaping up to be extremely predictable, which scares the hell out of me because when that happens, all hell breaks loose in terms of the booking. So I have no idea what Vince McMahon has has up his sleeve or has on his mind for a card that looks so far on paper, all like slam dunks. You, I mean, you would anticipate Seth regaining. You would anticipate Charlotte beating Trish. You would anticipate Kofi retaining. I mean, so right now, it's a very predictable card on paper. Again, watch it when that happens. Be very careful when that happens. Okay, uh, moving down the line here to Finn Balor's interview regarding Bray Wyatt, a.k.a. The Fiend from last week. Uh, We saw footage from Raw last week when Wyatt attacked him, and Balor calls out Wyatt for a match at SummerSlam. And uh, Balor is interrupted by the, the Tron with a big screen, obviously. And Bray Wyatt in his sweater vest came out and, said that he's a fan of Balor, but The Fiend is not. And The Fiend accepts Balor's challenge. Um, Wyatt says that The Fiend is an abomination. And then the screen cuts to red and black, and Wyatt is wearing his mask and says, let me in. How did the WWE not see this as Wyatt being the babyface? How can you not see this 100 miles away? It feels as plain as day. Why they're trying to force Balor or, or uh, Wyatt into a heel role is beyond me. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe they're not even trying to put him as a heel, but he's attacking baby faces, which tells me that's his role. But uh, I believe that come SummerSlam, he's going to be cheered. At, well, I don't think the demon will be booed. Uh, it's just going to kind of be a let's cheer for Wyatt and not react to Finn because Finn Balor is a likable guy. He's not, he doesn't have the Roman Reigns symptom uh, uh, symptoms. He's respected. He's the underdog. All of that. So I don't think there'll be booze for Finn. It'll just be kind of like quieter cheers and a m- overwhelming response to Bray Wyatt because people are behind this character right now. They're feeling it. It's it's a creepy character. The mask is a plus. All of that. So uh, just. Keep that in mind, too. I think that the crowd reaction in this match is honestly more interesting to me than the outcome, which, again, on paper, looks like Wyatt should win this. And 
if he doesn't, I will be very perplexed. Wyatt has to win this match. And decisively and maybe quickly. This match could end in the blink of an eye. And you know, maybe that's the right way to book this match for a repackaged Bray Wyatt that had so much hype coming into his return. Maybe that's how you reintroduce him as a dominant force. A guy that comes in, is transformed, he's an abomination, he's the fiend, he, you know, and he doesn't have this back and forth, a gutsy performance, or whatever silly nonsense Michael Cole always likes to call Roman Reigns' victories are gutsy. Like, what the hell does that even mean? You know? Ugh. All right. Um, but maybe this shouldn't be a back and forth 50-50. Everybody takes everybody to the limit. I don't like that. I don't like everyone being on a level playing field where it always has to be uh, like a 51 to 49 win. Like it doesn't always have to be, you know, 10-9 if you're, if you're looking at baseball or, I, I don't know, 21-20 in football. Why does it always have to be someone just always edging it out? Uh, I, I never understood that. That's not all matches, but that seems to be the WWE style. Everyone's not on a, no one's in a pecking order. It's everyone's on a landscape and either we trade wins or we uh, make sure that if you face me, you take me to the limit. Oh, I took you to the limit. Uh, Did you? You shouldn't, I shouldn't have to go to the limit to defeat, you know, like silly things like that. Um, And I mean, but look, I enjoyed SmackDown overall. I'm trying to keep this positive. I'm trying to keep this positive. I, I do have uh, one other thing that I want to just quickly comment on that I'm going to try not to make a rant. I'm going to really, really try in, in just a, a moment or two. But uh, one other thing, too, off WWE topics is uh, that AEW is going to be premiering October 2nd on TNT Drama. So mark your calendars, folks. Mark your calendars. It's going to be a hell of a fall if you're a wrestling fan. Football starts. Okay. You have WWE looking to respond in a big way with their Fox deal. Their billion dollar Fox deal. You have AEW starting. It's going to be a wild October on top of baseball playoffs if you're a baseball fan. October is going to be wild if you're a sports and wrestling fan. It's going to be insane, and I can't wait. I can't wait. So balancing that out with a little bit of a very quiet, I'm going to try to, you know, I'm going to really try to not go off the rails here. You know, why does everything that everyone does in every program have to be labeled as a message or a statement? What? Why? Why? I think I mentioned this before. Now, I may be overdoing it and overstating it that everything is always labeled as that, but every week, multiple times on the show, SmackDown and Raw, I hear the announcers label things as, he's sending a message. Oh, he's making a statement. (sighs) Can we find a thesaurus and go in the thesaurus and just say, Hey, what's a synonym for statement? What's a synonym for a message? Maybe it's just the overuse of those terms. It's the corporate labeling of those terms that makes me cringe. Because if these shows are supposed to feel spontaneous, why is everybody using the same label for everything that happens? Even in promos, I'm starting to hear, we're going to make a statement. What, what What does that mean? What does that mean anymore? Why does everything have to be a statement or a message? I'm telling you. You guys, maybe you're not hearing it on Raw and SmackDown. But it's been happening for a very long time now. Just keep scorecard at home. I would say the over-under on those two words being used in combination it's probably five every single show. I'm not kidding you. It's it's just may, maybe more, maybe more. I haven't kept tally because I tune out the that word, and I have the Hulu version of Raw, so I only see an hour and a half versus three hours. But just and is anybody else noticing this? 
Anybody else seeing this? And, and does it bother anybody else? <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Okay, well, my very quiet rant over that could have exploded. Okay, uh, moving on to Samoa Joe and Kofi Kingston. It was a it was a no contest. So Samoa Joe didn't lose. That's a plus. Um, and it was a non title match. Randy Orton turned uh, around on the ramp and. It looks like Randy Orton is going to stay for ringside just to get a closer look. And uh, it ended up having to be where Randy Orton interfered and went for an RKO on Kofi. Kofi reversed. It looks like they're going to fight as Kofi Kingston stands there like, you know, Mr. Miyagi was teaching him karate or something in some kind of weird pose. Like he wants to fight. I've never seen Kofi ever stand like that in a fighting position. Is that a true fighting position? Like, is that a martial arts position? Like a defensive stance? Like, what is that? I, I don't know what the hell that was with Kofi. Um, but he ends up giving Samoa Joe the RKO. So don't worry. While Joe didn't lose the match, he was left laying. <laughs> Joe just can't catch a break. Oh, oh my gosh. Um but uh, Kofi Kingston then hit Trouble in Paradise on Randy Orton. So Randy Orton was left laying, and Kofi Kingston was the last man standing. So uh, Kofi, once again, is not victorious here because it was a no contest, but was the last man standing and the, the lasting image of him standing there with the WWE Championship held high. And also with New Day on commentary, mm, um they have their moments and I don't mind when they're being silly, you know, especially when uh, we had Shinsuke Nakamura come out and they're playing their guitar and just being silly. That's fine. But when there's a serious segment going on, like Shawn Michaels and Dolph Ziggler, and they're still fooling around and saying, you know, like it's almost like they're in a, you know, outside school when people are rapping against each other and someone hits a good line and you hear people go, oh, I, I, I don't need that sophomoric humor when there's a serious storyline going on from the new day. I, I just I just don't need it. Um, but overall, I didn't I don't hate them on commentary because they're unscripted and unfiltered for the most part within reason. They're entertaining, but entertaining during times when the storyline warrants a light humor type of t- uh, tenure towards it. And when. Again, Shawn Michaels is out there. I don't need New Day you know, acting sophomoric. I, that I did not like. As good as that segment was, it was kind of like, New Day, shut up. Shut up. I'm getting – this is a serious part of the the, uh, the the story, a serious part of the show. Please, I'm begging you. Begging you. All right. Um, but speaking of Shinsuke Nakamura, we did get a Shinsuke Nakamura and Apollo Crews match. This was a very good match. You know, this was a good outing for uh, Apollo Crews. Probably his best outing that he's had in quite some time. Um, Crews started off strong and hits an elbow on Nakamura for a two count. I'm just reading kind of bullets and follow-ups to this. Uh, I'm not reading things word for word. But Nakamura looked for the Kinshasa, but Cruz dodges it and hits an Insiguri on him. And then Cruz follows up with an Olympic slam. That wasn't really a great Olympic slam, but it was one. Um, the cruise version of it. How about that? Uh, Nakamura eventually got the Kinshasa for the win and then hit the Kinshasa again after the match, further cementing Shinsuke Nakamura as a heel. Um, this was beneficial for both guys. I think it was a match that furthered both men, uh, put Cruz back in the contention of a legitimate competitor. At least he's feeling competitive and he's getting on the show. Those are both pluses at this point in Apollo Cruz's career and the things that he's been through and had to do. Even being on the show and being competitive in a match is a step in the right direction. That's how far the bar has fallen for Apollo Cruz, one of the first guys called up from NXT. Um, so a plus for Apollo Cruz and Shinsuke Nakamura, a plus there for getting a clean victory and then doing the heel thing by attacking him after the match again. Um, it, it's just, it's a great way to see that the nasty side of uh, Shinsuke. So plus, plus both guys benefited uh, great pairing. And I wouldn't mind seeing it again. I really wouldn't. If they told us there was a rematch next week, Hey, like, sign me up. I think that they did very well together. Um, we saw Mandy Rose, by the way, and Sonya Deville backstage. And 
Mandy says she's been talking with Shane and taking care of business and that they're getting a match against the Iconics next week. And if they win, they're getting a tag title shot. I don't think that's how Mandy actually said it. I think that Sonya Deville said, we get a tag title shot next week. And she's like, yeah. And if we win, we get a tag team title shot. And I'm like, maybe I heard it wrong. Maybe I was doing something. And I don't know. I was walking to work when I was trying to catch up on SmackDown. That's how little time I have. I'm literally walking to work out of my, after I get out of my car, I walk to work. It's about a 15 minute walk from the parking garage. And I'm catching up on SmackDown during that time. So maybe I misheard it. Maybe I misheard uh, Mandy Rose say those exact words, but I understood the meaning. So they get a tag team title shot if they beat the Iconics next week. And I think they will. I think they will. So that's fine with me. Um, And then there's a lot of highlights from the Raw reunion, which basically featured Hulk Hogan and Stone Cold Steve Austin and Ric Flair. You know, the big top, top, top names. And uh, I already gave my thoughts on that uh, on yesterday's show with Stone Cold really stealing the show and uh, having a very heartfelt message. Um that only Stone Cold could do in the way that only he could do last night on Monday Night Raw or two nights ago on Raw. So uh, very, very well done. And uh, I don't mind seeing the reminders of that. I think it, you know, seeing these stars is always a good thing because guess what call makes ratings. Guess what? Guess what brings people back? Guess what gets people emotionally invested? Not silly philanthropy, not 50, 50 booking, not a landscape tiered type of roster. But major stars, 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 stars. That's how you build your brand. You don't build your brand and then try to build stars. You build your brand by building stars, which enhances your brand in which they are a part of. WWE's philosophy has got it all backwards. And Vince McMahon has gone on record of saying, got to protect the brand, got to protect my brand, got to protect my brand. Well, if you, your idea of protecting the brand is by stifling and suffocating stars so that they don't get too big, your ideology is backwards, pal, as Vince would say. Think about it. You don't create a successful brand by focusing on the brand because the brand is not the – a brand means nothing without substance. What's your substance? Wrestlers or as you call them, performers. Like magicians, right? I mean, I just can't get past that performer word. It's like community theater. I mean, that's a performer to me. Broadway, they're performers. These guys and gals are wrestlers. So call them such, but it's a dirty word now. So, uh, but Vince McMahon is so concerned about protecting his brand, but the brand is the substance. The substance is the wrestlers. You build the wrestlers, make them stars. In turn creating a better brand and expanding your brand. Pretty damn simple. Pretty simple. Pretty easy concept. And I don't run WWE. I never ran a major corporation. You figure that if somebody would whisper in Vince McMahon's ear, hey, you want to maybe focus on just building stars instead of just building your brand by other non uh, nonsensical means? All right. Okay. Well, but I, I promise, I really did enjoy SmackDown Live. I really did. Uh, a lot of good stuff there, and I'll, I'll just kind of summarize the things I loved. Loved HBK and Ziggler more than I thought I would. With uh, Ziggler ending up getting the super kick rather than Sean getting it, but we all know he's going to return the favor. Uh, I loved Randy Orton's uh, promo against Kofi Kingston about bringing that match back from 2009 in Madison Square Garden. Um, th- their promo felt real. I'm looking to the continuation of this build. Very well done on both ends there. Um, you know, talking about how oh, you faked the Jamaican accent. I didn't have to do that. I just had to be Randy Orton. Basically saying he does. He just has to barely try to be successful. And I already outlined that. Plus there. Kevin Owens going stunner happy. I think Kevin Owens has hit about six stunners on Shane McMahon in three weeks. It's just crazy. He's hitting about two stunners per show. I, I mean, it's, uh, it's great to see, but I think... It, it, this this success that Kevin is having against Shane McMahon comes to a screeching halt next week on SmackDown Live. Kevin Owens is going to end up uh, getting his ass beat badly. The heat needs to come back to Shane. Shane has gotten beat up so bad the last couple of weeks against uh, from Sh- from Kevin Owens. He needs to get his heat back. You need to make the fans want to see Kevin Owens beat the holy hell out of Shane McMahon. 
because we've seen that now weeks in a row. So the next couple of weeks, look out. Kevin is going to take beating after beating after beating after beating, and it's going to make you want to tune into SummerSlam and buy the network and see Kevin get his revenge on Shane. So look out for that too. I, I can guarantee to you that that's going to be the case. Um, so plus there, I love Shinsuke Nakamura and Apollo Crews and what they did, el- really elevating e- each other and elevating the championship in 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 turn. Really good there as well. Um, and ultimately looking forward to Trish and Charlotte too. I mean that that's I think something that while it's not official yet in any kind of capacity, it's all but official, and I'm fine with it too. Um, just keep Trish off the mic. I mean, please, please, unless it's like a sit down interview or something, I'm, that's good. But one on one, when you're going to put Charlotte's wit against Trish, eh, I wouldn't do it. Don't do it. Um, but look, I'm looking forward to WWE's uh, pay per view SummerSlam. I think there's a lot there to offer. I think that we have a lot to look forward to. The programming is slowly improving, as I told everybody to expect. It's not going to be an overnight change, particularly that Bischoff has not been in tune with the product over the last few years. He's got a lot to catch up on. And if you don't know the product intimately and you're not involved intimately, you need to take baby steps. You don't just create radical change to create radical change. So don't expect a whole massive amount of change immediately on SmackDown Live, um, really, or Raw for that matter. I know Paul Heyman's been there, but um, you don't create change so radically to just make a statement. Oh, I said it. I said the key word. Do I get a prize? Um, you don't just create a, make a statement just because, oh, I'm here. I got I to gotta make an impact right away, right away, right away, right away. No, 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 no. So, um But I'm looking forward to what these two can do. Apparently, this was the very first production meeting in which Eric Bischoff was involved for this past week on SmackDown. So uh, did I notice a change? Not really, but I don't expect to. I don't expect to. Uh, I think it's going to be incremental. So, all right, guys. Well, that's all I got for you guys today, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. I'll be back tomorrow with my co-host to discuss everything in this wacky world of wrestling this week. And um, that'll close out the week in this podcast and then be back Sunday with your wrestling nostalgia moment. And I'm really digging over what I should do and mulling over what I should do this uh, this Sunday. Um, I've had a couple of suggestions, notably uh, Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle at WrestleMania, um, among others. And uh, it's going to be a tough one. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I'm going to mull it over. And uh, if you have suggestions, shoot them my way. If you guys have a, a wrestling nostalgia moment, that you want to hear me discuss on this show and revisit and, and relive and, and share again with you guys, email me or DM me on Twitter at the WWE podcast. Again, email is real WWE podcast at gmail.com. So take your pick. I'm available on both and let me know what you'd like to hear me discuss. Again, check out WWE podcast.com or any podcast app. If you'd like to download the show and subscribe, if you subscribe, every single show just immediately gets downloaded for you. So that way you don't miss a single episode. All right, guys. Well, as always, thanks for listening. I'll talk to you next time.